South Vietnam is a land of villages. The villagers are the prize in a 30 year struggle for hearts and minds. Friendship for one side brings destruction from the other. The U.S. wins the village war, but loses South Vietnam. Between 1965-68, America commits half a million troops to Vietnam. The main strategy is to search out communist forces and destroy them. But many policymakers say the war should be fought politically, not militarily. Former CIA director William Colby. As the tension level grew in Vietnam, the tendency was to strengthen the military forces against the prospect of an attack by North Vietnam. Now here I think the Americans made a fundamental error that uh, pr uh, pursued us all the way through Vietnam. Because we said that if there's a war going on, it must be an affair for soldiers. And we consequently thought of building up the military response to a war. 1960. William Colby becomes CIA chief in Saigon. He helps the government develop a program of rural self-defense. The fortified villages get weapons from the CIA and militia training from U.S. Special Forces advisors. They are called strategic hamlets. The program to secure the villages is called pacification. But few villages resist the guerrilla attacks. In 1962, the late French historian Bernard Fall records the escalating war. This is the village of uh, Mi Thuy, which is a small village not too far from Saigon, at the edge of the uh, Mekong Delta. It's probably got 2,000 inhabitants, like most of the small villages in Vietnam. There are about 12,000 such units in this country. And its population is mostly Buddhist. To the Vietnamese peasant, uh, the war means a total disturbance of his way of life. He's being shelled by one side or bombed, or he's being resettled in villages. He's been very often resettled three or four times in different villages. He's being taxed by both sides, and uh, now the uh, communist tax is extremely heavy. The uh, communist taxes now run about ten times the government taxes. The peasant doesn't go for ideology, the peasant goes for social justice. He wants his piece of land, and he wants a fair taxation system. He doesn't want to be robbed by the army. Neither does he want, by the way, to be tortured by the VC. He wants to be basically left alone. The guerrillas, called the National Liberation Front, use selective execution as the first stage of taking over a village. They allegedly killed 37,000 people during the war years. Journalist Tan Tatien. In my own village, they killed about 90 people. And many of these had nothing to do with politics or anything. They were simple farmers or workers, but they were articulate and they could provide leadership and they had to, to be got rid of. Anti-communist Vietnamese called the guerrillas Viet Cong or VC. Soldiers call him Charlie. Charlie. He had a habit. It was a good habit because it worked. He'd come in one night, find out who's in charge, go to them and say, listen, tomorrow morning we're coming back. We want so much food and we want so many men. 
And if you don't give them to us, it might be bad on you. And they take everything, everything they could get their hands on, food, gold, silver, anything that was in the tent. Having killed or intimidated village leaders, the rebels settled in the village. Some stay for years. Land reform is the next stage. The land is now equally divided among the peasant farmers. Using traditional communist methods, the guerrillas set out to build a strong political organization. Every villager must join a political group. Peasants are gradually retrained as cadres, or political leaders of farmers, women, and youths. The communists encourage group self-criticism. They appeal to nationalism, instilling hatred of the old order and of the white Americans in Vietnam. They are widely successful. In 1965, the Central Intelligence Agency draws a political map. It shows 50% of the countryside is under some degree of communist control. The U.S. sends combat troops. For the Saigon government, the battle for the villages is the most important front of the war. President Nguyen Van Chiu. The, the whole thing consisted that they, how to recapture uh, the people from the hand of uh, Viet Cong, the communist, and to uh, promote, to, to help them to promote a better life. So I think the better life and the prosperity in the countryside, which composed 95% of the people in the country, is uh, the, the best weapon against communists. 1965, village operations combine military and psychological tactics. Vietnamese troops and American advisors surround the area. The villagers are told that friendly people have nothing to fear. The soldiers evacuate the village, then search it. If there is evidence of communist activity, the village is considered a military base and is usually destroyed. Press critics see pacification as cruelty to civilians. The U.S. commander, General William Westmoreland, says that picture is distorted. As one who has fought in three wars, I can say categorically that never in the history of warfare, certainly never in the history of uh, the use of American arms, have more attention been given to the avoidance of civilian casualties than we did in Vietnam. There was a famous case of burning a village uh, by the Marines outside of Da Nang. But that village uh, had been a, a place where the enemy had, uh, was harbored by the local population. But before those uh, villages were burned, the, the, the people living in those villages were humanely uh, relocated, uh, which was the general practice. By 1967, Communist captives number 17,000, but civilian refugees number one and a quarter million. Villages are destroyed to deny use by the communists. Combat in the villages is seen as counterproductive by many Vietnamese. General Tran Van Don. If there, is, there were some enemies in one village, they used the American way to far, a very far power to destroy the village because there were some enemies inside. And after that, to occupy the village. But for me, for us, it was not a good way. If we destroy the village, we destroy the people too. Helicopter gunships now routinely attack communist-controlled villages. Communists portray pacification as brutal war on a helpless population.
Although Saigon controls the politics, Americans control the firepower and are blamed. A soldier recalls. The thing that stands out in my mind more than anything else was I saw a woman looking at me with an expression of hate, of pure, unadulterated hate. And at that point, I know I was in Vietnam. I never saw such hate in my life on somebody's face. For suspected communist agents, interrogation is brutal. Water poured on a cloth induces suffocation. In late 1966, more money is put into pacification. Suspect villages are promised amnesty. My dear fellow citizens, we came here today to begin an operation aimed at clearing this area and mopping up the hidden Viet Cong to bring security to all of you. We understand that among you, there are some who have naively listened to the Viet Cong propaganda and have joined the rebels. Among them are some of your husbands, your brothers. So please advise them to come back. We are ready during this pacification program to admit them back to society and to assist them. You can help us. One program is called County Fair. We'll give him some cough syrup and some nose drops. This will take care of his cold, OK? It combines military operations with medical care, food handouts, entertainment. From the beginning, Americans differ on the so-called Hearts and Minds program. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge is optimistic. In 1965, Lodge foresees U.S. forces giving pacification a new push. Soon after, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara visits Vietnam. He calls pacification the key factor, but judges it a basic disappointment. He warns that extraordinary imagination and effort should go into changing the approach. A year after McNamara's warning, pacification is still failing. By now, one in 12 of South Vietnam's population are refugees. In 1967, the war widens. More and more North Vietnamese troops are involved, but American field commanders remain confident. The Americans largely contain the communist regulars to border areas. U.S. strategy relies on South Vietnamese forces to clear the countryside. But rebel forces are still successful against government troops. Thousands are taken prisoner. A quarter of the army deserts. One in four of the rebel weapons are captured American models. Government troops no longer move into the villages. The guerrillas boast of moving among the people like fish through water. They can now step up political indoctrination, the final phase of the communist war program. Medals are given to peasants who take up arms. By 1967, communist strength in the South is estimated at 300,000 men most of them Southerners. The communists have taken heavy casualties, but they now rest in safe havens and plan a wider war. The communists enlist the peasantry in distributing supplies from the north. By 1967, almost half the guerrilla weapons are Soviet and Chinese made. 
At this time, 100,000 North Vietnamese regulars infiltrate south. The southern guerrillas provide a nationally organized supply and intelligence system. They are supremely confident. They are winning at the grassroots. Now, after two years of failure, President Johnson insists on a different approach. He gives control of pacification to a new civilian agency, its director, Robert Comer. We tried to design a system whereby we Americans could find out what was going on down at the Hamlet level. We called it the Hamlet Evaluation System. The U.S. evaluation, the communist control or influence 60% of the villages, far more than Saigon reports. We didn't trust the Vietnamese reports. They were wildly exaggerated. So we tried to get the Americans to sort of keep tabs on the Vietnamese. We wrote, so to speak, the report cards for the district and province chiefs. And I think most people would agree that it was a very healthy corrective. At least we weren't corrupt. We may have been ignorant. We may not have understood a lot that was going on, but at least you could get more honest evaluations out of Americans than you could get out of Vietnamese, especially since they were working for a government in Saigon that did not want to hear bad news. It is a new phase. Leaflets replace the bombs. They say that only communists want war. The new pacification agency is known as CORDS. It provides huge multi-purpose aid, wheat, miracle rice, pharmaceuticals, light bulbs, garbage trucks, sewing kits, machine tools, toothbrushes, and an atomic reactor. This economic aid costs $850 million, just one twentieth of the military cost. Comer claims success. I would say that basically the 1967 program, which really didn't hit its stride uh, until 1969 and 70, partly because it was critically interrupted by the Tet Offensive of 68, which just sort of set us back when we were barely getting going. But the fact of the matter is, and uh, the more sophisticated members of the press saw and wrote about the same thing, that by 70, 71, we had really pacified most of the populated areas of South Vietnam. Now, that did not mean that a lot of fighting wasn't going on back in the boonies, as they call them. But essentially, most of the countryside was reasonably secure. The one thing that we had not been very successful at, as I mentioned before, was in rooting out the clandestine Viet Cong infrastructure the enemy's control structure, which remained behind underground, and which we were very unsuccessful in getting at. Now the policy is to fight a political battle. It becomes one of the most controversial programs of the war, Phoenix. The CIA director of Phoenix, William Colby. The purpose was to centralize, in the central intelligence concept, all the knowledge that all the different intelligence agencies had about this kind, this structure, so that sensible action could be taken against it. Now, if this was the enemy command structure, obviously we wanted to know who they were, who its secret agents were, things of this nature, what kinds of programs they were conducting, uh, not just the military units, but what kind of tax collecting, what kind of proselyting, what kind of kidnapping, things of this nature, what their terrorist programs were and all the rest to put agents into it, to get defectors out of it, to interrogate prisoners from it, and gradually to build up a knowledge of what this unit was. An assessment of Phoenix from a CIA agent in Saigon, Frank Snepp. It was supposed to generate intelligence, but uh, the concept quickly uh, became victim to practicalities. Uh, the first problem was that we really didn't know who a communist operative was. Uh, there was never a firm definition. 
Was a communist operative, a communist political agent, simply a, a water boy? Or was a political cadre someone who was a full-time communist? We never could figure out precisely whom we should be targeting. Uh, then there was another problem. The PRU, the hit teams, were going out, arresting, pulling back to our interrogation centers, a great many people. And uh, the prisons quickly uh, came to overflowing. To give you an idea of how the, um, the Phoenix program was targeted, I think I can conjure up an example. Let's say that a mafia chieftain uh, was out to nail one of his, uh, one of his opponents. He knew his opponent was uh, having dinner in a particular restaurant in New York, and so he sends his hitmen in. Uh, the hitmen go in, they open up with a shotgun. They get the bartender, the bartender's son, a waiter. They also get the opposition uh, figure, the target himself. Well, that's basically how the Phoenix program operated, except for the fact that, of course, it wasn't a bar or a restaurant that the hits uh, took place in. It was a village or a hamlet. If there was a fight outside the village at night, you went out in the morning and you found that, sure enough, people had been killed on both sides in that kind of a battle. Some on your side, some on the enemy side. When you identified who those were on the enemy side, sure enough, one of them was the head of the local guerrilla force, one of your leaders that had been on your list. Now, he hadn't been assassinated, he'd been killed. William Colby testifies at congressional hearings called in 1971. The Phoenix program was not a program of assassination. The Phoenix program was a part of the overall pacification program. How many, roughly, would you estimate were eliminated? Well, the elimination was all three categories because the word eliminate referred to the entire uh, program against the apparatus. Uh, well, you can say we, kill them if we you want. We said kill. I believe that the figures in mid-71 that were testified to at, at that time were that some 28,000 had been captured, some 20,000 had been killed, and some 17,000 had, had actually rallied by that time. In the end, America claims success in the village war. But the conflict moves beyond the village to large-scale conventional warfare. By 1968, one-third of South Vietnam's 17 million population have been relocated. A million are still refugees by 1971. Millions more will be uprooted in the larger battles ahead. Once viewed as the key to the war, the people are now just in the way. For 12 years, under three presidents, the CIA's William Colby believes intelligence information is unheeded. He is critical of the reliance on military solutions. Colby first goes to Vietnam in 1959. He is sent again in 1968 to direct village pacification. He finds improvement. The fact was there were provinces uh, in Vietnam, many of them. Uh, when I went to them in, in 1968, when I went back to Vietnam, I would go out two nights a week to go out in the country and spend the night someplace, talk to our people. In 68, I would have to go to a provincial capital, ringed with barbed wire, with tanks. You'd be mortared or rocketed during the night. When I went out in early 71, I could drive through the countryside in the night without any concern about safety in the same areas that had been so pro prohibited. Now, I think the problem was our bad perception of the nature of the war early on, and then our disgust with it, leading to our withdrawal from the military side of the equation at exactly the time the North Vietnamese turned to the pure military assault. Until the 1968 Tet Offensive, the U.S. military directs the war. Though Tet shatters U.S. public confidence, it also shatters guerrilla strength, enabling American forces to gradually secure the villages. But with a thousand Americans dying in combat each month, there's pressure to Vietnamize the war. Saigon's army, called Arvin, is unprepared. Conscription only now begins. 
And it's a race to improve training, equipment, and morale before the U.S. can announce plans to withdraw. The Arvin now numbers 427,000 men, still fewer than the U.S. force. But despite America's disillusionment, President Johnson and then President Nixon pledge full ongoing support for Saigon. Johnson, while ending his own presidency, personally reassures President Tu. Mr. President, our pledge to help your people defeat aggression stands firm against all obstacles and against any deception. We realize that the, uh, even if uh, President Johnson uh, send more troops to Vietnam, it's a, uh, just uh, to have a ne negotiated solution, not to win a military victory uh, in the common sense. Washington has initiated peace talks. Chu's forces are told not to expect victory, but to show they can hold out. The U.S. only now begins to upgrade South Vietnam's outdated military machine. Saigon's Navy gets the latest PT boats to defend the Delta. For the first time, the Arvin gets the standard machine guns and rifles used by U.S. forces. Saigon's troops are now on a more equal footing with Hanoi's Soviet-equipped army. With the weapons, the South Vietnamese soldiers get advanced training special paratroop and commando units are formed. The South Vietnamese Air Force builds to the fourth largest in the world. The United States military aid bill soars, and so do its hopes for reduced American involvement. January 1969, President Richard Nixon is inaugurated. The greatest honor history can bestow is the title of peacemaker. This honor now beckons America, the chance to help lead the world at last out of the valley of turmoil and onto that high ground of peace that man has dreamed of since the dawn of civilization. Nixon sees protests threatening an honorable exit. Defense Secretary Melvin Laird. When I became Secretary of Defense, in 1969, uh, we had over 550,000 young men on the ground in Vietnam. We had Americanized the war. I made the decision and I recommended to the Congress and to the President that we Vietnamize the war, we de-Americanize the war, that we get Americans out of Vietnam. Nixon now meets with President Chu at Midway Island. He tells Chu that the U.S. will immediately withdraw 25,000 troops. At first, Chu objects strenuously, but gradually accepts the inevitable. The ceremonies at Midway are a changing of the guard. We wish you well personally. More than that, the people of the United States wish your people well. We look forward to the day when they can live in peace together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank you very much for your very comfortable words. Uh, Hugh believes in Vietnamization. He later distrusts Nixon, but now supports him. Uh, it's very useful. I would like to uh, emphasize again, it's a constant uh, duty of Vietnamese people to take uh, over more responsibility and to alleviate the burden of the U.S. people to support in us uh, to defend the freedom in Vietnam. Nixon has pledged to end the Vietnam War, but he has a greater priority, ending the Cold War. He believes an enforced settlement in Vietnam is a part of this wider goal. His security advisor, Henry Kissinger, calls Vietnam 
a sideshow. July 1969. Troop withdrawals begin. President Chu is not yet alarmed. Many times before, through many presidents of the United States, and also through President Nixon, they pledge time and then again to help the Vietnamese people, the South Vietnamese people, in both economic aid and military aid as long as they still need to fight uh, communist invasion. So that's the reason why I trust them. South Vietnamese forces increased to almost 500,000. Chu is encouraged. I think that, that the Vietnamization, if he's, uh, it's, it's honestly done, it's a fully done, it's a continuous one, it could be a way to prevent the uh, collapse of South Vietnam. The creation of a modern South Vietnamese army is a massive feat. But like the American forces, it does not hold the countryside. In Hanoi, too, it is a time of change. In September 69, Ho Chi Minh dies of a heart attack. Known as Uncle Ho, North Vietnam's founder and first president, is deeply mourned by the people he led for 25 years. Ho's legacy is a stable leadership. His earliest colleagues, military commander General Jap and Prime Minister Pham Van Dong, have been with him 30 years. Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin, attending the funeral, reaffirms the USSR's $1 billion a year aid. Communist Party chief Lei Zuan takes overall command. He reads Ho Chi Minh's last will, an exhortation to fight until the last Yankee has gone. After Ho's death, North Vietnamese border infiltration reduces slightly as the North concentrates on domestic rebuilding. Though communist supplies and forces are still enough to enable a new offensive at any time, the trail is considered vulnerable to a ground attack. To protect the trail, the North Vietnamese establish base camps inside Laos. These are the target of Operation Lam Son, the 1971 South Vietnamese invasion. War returns to Khe Sanh. The abandoned base, scene of bloody combat in 1968, is reactivated. This will be the first test of Vietnamization. Success will give much needed confidence to the South Vietnamese forces. The Americans will provide only supply planes and air cover as an elite South Vietnamese infantry division invades southern Laos. The objective, to sever communist supply routes. North Vietnamese war material reaches South Vietnam through Laos along the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail. Heavy guns and large troop contingents are able to move 50 miles a day. The North Vietnamese are sending more troops south than the US is withdrawing. This jeopardizes America's plan to turn the war over to South Vietnam. The Laos invasion has four phases. First, a 10,000-man U.S. force will take up artillery support positions at the border. Next, 17,000 South Vietnamese troops will advance on the crossroads town of Che Pong. Third, the destruction of communist bases. The final phase is withdrawal. President Nguyen Van Thieu. We said that on a limited time, we have to do our best in the Ho Chi Minh Trail to try our best 
to destroy as much as possible the logistic compound of the North Vietnamese communists along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we can delay the, uh, the offensive. They, they have a plan uh, for the northern province of Vietnam. And they, uh, to reduce the, the, the war potential of North Vietnamese throughout the South Vietnam. But preparations cannot be kept secret. The US high command is divided. State Department officials claim that South Vietnamese forces are too few and inexperienced, but the military supports the invasion. February 8th, Arvin troops start moving toward Laos. The communists quickly and easily reinforce. The ability to mass so many troops so quickly is a surprise to the American and Vietnamese high command. The South Vietnamese army is unaware it is surrounded and outnumbered two to one. The going at first is easy, deceptively so. But former Premier Nguyen Cao Ki says the mission is not aggressive enough. I was up there to inspect the field with my wife. And in the very first days of invasion, and the way that they carry the, the plan, I already, if remember well, I already said it will be a failure. And Mr. Thieu at that time, Blame me that uh, I am wrongly criticized. If you decide to go there to stop their supply line, and you have to go there and stay there. If we go to Chepon, even though we know that we, we cannot stay longer, but it's a point of honor to show to the communists that, that we can go to Chepon and stay there even one day and go back. On the eve of battle, the U.S. military still supports the action. But Secretary of State Kissinger later describes it as conceived in doubt and confusion. Using U.S. helicopters, 17,000 troops vault into Laos. Inside Laos, the operation stalls. Beyond the Arvin artillery fire, the North Vietnamese are in control. Earlier U.S. plans to attack the trail called for at least 60,000 troops. By this estimate, South Vietnam's invading force is only one-third what it should be. The battle escalates, tanks against artillery. American gunners inside South Vietnam increase their fire. Communist artillery responds in a long-range duel. The main South Vietnamese target is just 25 miles inside Laos. But after three weeks, they are still only halfway there. The U.S. sends fighter bombers, but communist air defense is far tougher than anticipated. Communist troops move closer to the South Vietnamese positions, preventing widespread airstrikes. Troop helicopters take the heaviest losses. 100 are shot down. 176 Americans are killed.
After four weeks, the Arvin troops reached the town of Chepan, but again faced unexpected fire from Soviet ground rockets. The invaders retreat. Communist supply camps, the initial objective of the operation, are untouched. The North Vietnamese counterattack, some South Vietnamese units are annihilated. The US military criticizes Arvin for not holding, but President Thieu accuses the Americans of being the first to back off. Now, what, what went wrong is that they, after the, 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 the first week of preparation, as that the Americans have suffered many casualties on pilot, helicopter pilots, and they reduce, and they reduce most totally the number of helicopter uh, used for the medical evacuation. That's the reason why the Vietnamese troops cannot advance further, because they are, uh, they have to take care of the, the wounded, you know, the, the, the dead, and that slow down the advance of Vietnamese troops deeper in Laotian territory, and that give advantage to the North Vietnamese troops to react the Lam Sun operations was a failure because of planning, because the operation itself was unnecessary. If you send your troops to make an enclave to draw the communist troops and then destroy them, yes. But just to go there, you know, in that jungle area uh, for a promenade, you know. What for? What for? The failure in Laos severely damages the military command structure. Many of the best officers are captured or killed. Although the Saigon government holds a victory parade, both Nixon and Thieu now doubt the ability of South Vietnam to fight the war alone. The Pentagon says it has done what it can for South Vietnam. Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird. You can give them the training and the equipment so that they can use their manpower. If they do not use it effectively, that is something that you cannot ensure through any kind of military activity. The, the American used the Vietnamization, the so-called Vietnamization program as a pretext to withdraw the troops, to scut and run, and to, uh, to abandon the South Vietnamese uh, uh, people alone and to be overrun later by the North Vietnamese communists with a certain time after that. That's the so-called the decent interval. America continues its troop withdrawal, but in April 1972, a major communist offensive overruns the northern province. But by July, only 45,000 Americans remain. The farewells are formality. South Vietnam is alone and bitter. At that time, the Americans would like to end the war as uh, fast as possible, to wash their hand, to quit the Vietnam for the, uh, the domestic problem in, 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 in the United States. And uh, that's their policy from, from, from the, 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 the time they, uh, they began to withdraw the troops and uh, uh, to pull out from Vietnam. I think it's, a, the, the, it's a, not an error in politics, not an error. It's a, a deliberate, uh, wrong politic, but deliberate. We went to Vietnam not to destroy freedom, but to defend it. We went to Vietnam not as an aggressor, but to stop aggression. And history will record that the American effort in Vietnam was a good cause 
honorably undertaken and honorably ended. Nixon and Chu have a final meeting in April 1973, soon after the signing of a peace agreement with Hanoi. Chu claims his army cannot hold without massive American aid. Nixon reassures him that America will always aid South Vietnam. But within 18 months, Nixon will have resigned. In two years, the war will be over. South Vietnam obtains the most sophisticated weaponry in Asia. This is part of a special $1 billion military aid program called Operation Enhance. It comes just before the signing of the Paris Peace Accords. But without future replacements, the new array of jets, tanks, and guns will be useless. President Thieu's Minister of Economic Development, Nguyen Tien Hung. Vietnamization has a very serious flaws. First, that it did not cope with the reality of Vietnam. Shall I say that uh, Vietnamization was carried out the, the American way, Americanized Vietnamization. In other words, the forces were trained, were equipped just like a regular uh, U.S. Uh, division with uh, tanks, artillery, helicopters, uh, so on. Which means that uh, you reinforce the South Vietnamese dependence on American supply. American docks are reinforced by misuse of facilities. Scores of former American camps are supposed to be used by the Vietnamese military, but many camps are looted. A base at Tay Ninh near Saigon. A few weeks after the Americans leave, even the supports have been removed. The trappings, furniture, and fittings go first. Then walls, roofs, and floors vanish. A symbolic sign remains, goodbye and good luck. <laughs> 